Careful, careful. What you're about to raise up and away is no ordinary industrial product, but a device of incalculable worth. A spaceship, handmade from end to end. A unique product of several hundred thousand man hours of labor. Should this vehicle be seriously damaged, its usefulness would be lost. And there would be no known way to make up for that loss. The nation would be set back by just that much in its space program. But no accident will occur. The vehicle will be cared for by engineers and technicians who will weigh it, align it, test it, and ship it without a bump or a scratch. And then place it on top of its booster. It's pretty sure to arrive here safely. But what guarantee is there that it will function correctly once it is launched into space? The mission of this vehicle is to go into orbit around the Earth and from there report the launching of all large missiles. In view of the almost intolerable cost of failure, of the fact that the vehicle is unique and irreplaceable, what assurance is there that it will be able to accomplish its difficult mission out there where no hand can reach to tighten the screw or make an adjustment? The answer is provided by the reliability program. Inherent reliability has been designed into it. Elements that could cause it to fail were identified and redesigned until the necessary expectation of life was achieved. The reliability program covers the entire weapon system, including all readout stations and ground control facilities. But we shall deal here with the system's flight elements only. that has just been launched is the workhorse of the space age. Its essential elements are the engine, which constitutes the propulsion system, fuel tanks, equipment racks on which the black boxes are mounted, and the airframe. In the case of the Agena vehicle, the reliability of these elements has been established by more than 50 flights in the course of the last several years. They can normally be relied upon to function without fail throughout the few hundred seconds of ascent. But there are other elements required for performance of mission once orbit has been achieved. Elements which must have a minimum life expectancy calculated in thousands of hours. These include the solar cells and associated batteries which constitute the satellite's power supply. The infrared scanner, which is the system's cyclopean eye. Attitude controls. Communications equipment and other devices. It is here in the design and construction of these components that the reliability engineers have concentrated their efforts using methods that were unknown until a few years ago. The limiting factor in reliability is always design. Just as a chain can be no stronger than its weakest link, no system can be more reliable than the weakest part designed into it. The design engineer is therefore a central figure in the reliability plot. His work is organized approximately as follows. In the case of program 461, the very concept of the system presupposes certain minimum standards of reliability. Its vehicles are designed for a mean life of one year after they go into orbit. Designers are assisted in the development of such equipment by a broad program of research in both materials and processes, and by the establishment of high rail parts whose expectation of life has already been determined. Their activities are policed by the design review boards and committees, which make sure nothing is overlooked. This is such a group in session. 
The item they are discussing is a small amplifier in one of the satellite's telemetry circuits. This is the design engineer, the man responsible for the drawings and specifications here being reviewed. His supervisor, the design manager, is the group chairman. This is the reliability engineer. And this is the piece parts specialist. The engineer at the blackboard is an outside consultant, an authority on circuitry of this type, who has been called in to participate in the discussions. Well, gentlemen, we seem to be quite well in agreement on the functional aspects of this circuit. But as I had stated previously, I suspect we're going to have problems with these carbon composition resistors in our field of radiation. So therefore, I recommend that we change over to these metal film high rel resistors. Now, these resistors are larger than the carbon composition resistors. As a matter of fact, they're about twice the volume. Where do these fit in this particular chassis, and do you actually have space for those? The result of these discussions is a design affording maximum reliability. If it lies altogether within the state of the art, it can probably be executed with high rel parts. Should new materials or processes be involved, the problem may be referred to research. The essential thing about high rel parts is that they have a known reliability factor, having been manufactured under careful surveillance and subjected to rigorous tests and controls. We are concerned here with the laws of probability which hold that under certain conditions, some events become statistically predictable. Consider, for example, a chain. The ability of a piece of chain to lift a given load is dependent upon every link in the system. Suppose every link has been previously tested and found to have a reliability factor with relation to a one-ton load of 95%. If there are 10 links in the chain, the probability of success in lifting the load is determined by multiplying together the factors representing the reliability of every separate link. 95 times 95 times 95, 10 times. The result is 60%. Although the individual link is 95% reliable, the 10 link section is only 60% reliable. And if there are 20 links in the chain, reliability will diminish further to only 36%. Approximately two times out of three, the system will fail to accomplish its mission, which is to lift and support the one-ton load. If there are 45 links in the chain, reliability becomes essentially zero. The chain will break in virtually every test. The analogy is an oversimplification but it does illustrate how rapidly reliability falls off as complexity increases. The more parts there are, the higher must be their individual reliability factors. In the case of the program 461 system, it has been found that the rate of random failures for such piece parts as solid state devices must not exceed a maximum of 1% per thousand hours of operation. Large numbers of individual parts, in this case transistors, are placed under load and monitored for months to determine their failure rate. With 10,000 separate pieces under test, each clock hour that passes represents 10,000 unit hours of test time. Results are plotted on a simple graph. The ordinate represents failures. The abscissa, unit hours of test time. Here, the first failure occurred 75 elapsed hours after the test began, after 750,000 unit hours of test time. The second failure occurred 60 clock hours later. The third, 15 clock hours after that. Throughout the next 95 hours, everything was normal. Then there occurred another failure, followed almost immediately by still another. Up to this point, the results were indecisive, 
falling well within the zone of no decision on the chart. And as the days passed, after a total of several million unit hours of test time, a few further failures occurred. Had the curve crossed the revocation line and moved into the area on the left, the parts would have been considered unacceptable. They would also have been considered unacceptable had the curve continued on the wrong side of the continued testing zone for more than some predetermined period, such as eight million unit hours. But long before this time had elapsed, the curve moved definitely into the approval region, demonstrating that these parts possess a reliability factor of 99.92%. A given part should function without fail for several hundred years. At another plant, diodes are subjected to a similar life test in a simulated space environment. Results are plotted much as they were in the transistor tests and to much the same parameters. Here, almost a thousand potentiometers have been under load for more than 10,000 hours to prove out their high rel characteristics. Their performance is well over on the winning side. The designer's task is simplified when he can specify such parts. But although their number is constantly increasing, this is not always possible. There are areas where new materials and processes must be developed before high rel parts can be made. A whole series of continuing studies at the company laboratories in Palo Alto are currently devoted to this research. Under a broad program of thermophysical investigation, the thermal radiation characteristics of various materials are determined and new surface coatings developed. This equipment measures the relative absorptivity and emissivity, the so-called alpha over epsilon characteristics of diverse materials in a simulated space environment. The behavior of adhesives, seals, sliding electrical contacts and lubricants in the space environment is studied under another series of tests and experiments. Materials that can assure greater structural reliability or longer life for mechanisms in space are being developed here. The motor in this bell jar with its specially lubricated bearings has been operating continuously in a vacuum for more than 10,000 hours. Another series of tests is concerned with the effects of radiation on component materials. Various materials are subjected to high intensity ultraviolet light while under vacuum. The effects of the penetrating radiation found in the Van Allen belt are studied with the aid of the big cyclotron at Berkeley. Solar cells, dielectric materials, and infrared detectors are bombarded with high energy protons. Surface sensitive materials such as optics, thermal surfaces, and insulating materials are studied under low energy radiation in the company's hot cell or with the aid of the Van de Graaff accelerator. In some instances, this work is done in advance of design requirements and the results published in the Satellite Environment Handbook or the Space Materials Handbook. So the design engineer is not without help in his task, even when he's pushing the state of the art. But all this constitutes only a part of the total reliability effort. Once maximum reliability has been designed into the system, the drawings move on to production, to procurement and manufacturing, and the collateral function of quality assurance. This is the hardware stage, and a new set of reliability procedures come into play. For example, it has been proven, as we have seen, that transistors manufactured in a particular way possess a reliability coefficient of 99.92%. The problem now is to make them that way infallibly. Inspectors must check every step in the process to be sure no degradation occurs. Finished parts are individually examined with great care. High rel standards require that a certain portion of each lot be chosen at random and set aside for reliability testing. Comparable procedures are followed in the manufacture of diodes, 
under the watchful eyes of quality assurance inspectors. Here again, higher rel specifications for manufacturing procedures have been established. Reliability has been designed into the product. The problem now is to defend it against all degradation. Here too, a portion of every lot is committed to extended testing. As with the higher rel transistors and diodes, every step in the manufacture of high rel potentiometers must be carried out according to specifications and the product subjected to the double check of 100% resident inspection and the test run of a random sample from each lot. Not until they have been proved out in this way can they be accepted as higher rel parts and sent forward for packing and shipment. Every separate higher rel part, no matter how small it may be, possesses its own identity and goes forward with a punched card that records its particular performance parameters. Nothing further can be done now to increase their reliability. And as they are subject only to degradation, extreme care must be exercised in handling them. The high rel label will save these containers from bumps and bruises in transit and get them special attention on arrival at their destination. Packages bearing the high rel label never reach the conveyor. They are taken directly from the pallet and after normal processing, carried unopened to a bonded stock room reserved exclusively for high rel parts. The packages are opened here and their contents examined carefully before being placed in stock. When high rail parts are required at the assembly line, they are called for in groups, which are kitted right here in the stock room. The kitted parts turn into components here in the dust-free atmosphere of this room, but their identity is still preserved. Should one of these parts ever fail, the lot that it came from could be identified at once. But there will be few failures. These high rail parts have an expectation of life equal to many times the system requirement. Similar procedures are followed at another plant where individual piece parts are assembled into a power module. As the slightest error might jeopardize the reliability of these units, the inspectors maintain constant vigilance. Mechanical devices used in the satellite are no less critical, and they too must be assembled with meticulous care from piece parts designed for maximum reliability. These jewel-like devices are gyros, which will be used in the orbital control system. Not only mechanics and electronics, but optics as well are involved in construction of the satellite's payload. The individual parts of this complex device have their own identity. There is a punched card for every device that goes into this little amplifier. The performance parameters of every separate IR cell have been ascertained and recorded. No diamond cutter works with more care. As hardware approaches completion, it proves to be of two kinds. Flight hardware, which will be put into orbit, and test hardware, which will be used only for reliability studies leading to further refinements of design. The distinction applies at all levels from piece parts on up to completed vehicles. To avoid unnecessary wear, flight hardware is subjected only to such testing as may be required to establish the compatibility of all parts. Test hardware, however, may be tested to destruction. Here, the complete orbital elements of a vehicle are being prepared for insertion in a vacuum chamber.
The device that surrounds it is a heat flux simulator, which will subject the vehicle to such temperature cycling as it would experience in orbiting the Earth. This, of course, is test hardware. It will remain in the chamber under high vacuum with all its circuits functioning as they would be in space for as long as 18 months. Flight hardware vehicles on completion of manufacture and the compatibility check known as an integrated systems run normally go directly to the launching pad. But the prototype of each new series stops off on the way at the company's Santa Cruz base for a test firing. When the elaborate instrumentation has been installed and the stand cleared, water deluges the flame bucket. Then the thunder of the engine bursts forth upon the mountainside. As soon as the test data have been reduced, the vehicle comes down from the stand and resumes its journey to the pad. Ready now to be launched, it is the focus of much attention by reliability personnel. An immense volume of data regarding this spaceship has now been accumulated, and an almost incredible mass of additional information will come streaming in the moment its booster lifts clear of the pad. The volume is so great as to require the use of a large data reduction center equipped with modern computers. Without this facility, the reliability program would bog down under the weight of reports so massive no man or group of men could hope to assimilate them. An essential phase of the high rel program is its feedback system. The constant flow of information from all operations back to the design engineers. As rapidly as experience can be analyzed and assimilated, it is incorporated in design modifications and improvements, leading to still greater reliability. As these vehicles circle the Earth, their telemetry circuits carry back immense quantities of information, which is correlated with reliability data on the parameters of their components. In some instances, as we have seen, down to individual piece parts. Every effort has been made to eliminate any weaknesses that may have appeared in circuits or mechanisms during previous flights. So although the manifold tasks of reliability continue, there are reasons for believing this complex device will survive the shock and violence of launch and accomplish its mission, even though no hand will ever again be able to reach it to tighten a screw or make an adjustment. Inherent reliability has been designed into this vehicle in order that it may function without fail throughout its expected lifespan in the austere environment of space.